We're going to look at Genesis chapter 14 today. Genesis 14, starting at verse 17. We've been talking about different prophets and priests and kings from the Old Testament and how they point ahead to Jesus Christ as the ultimate prophet, priest, and king. And in Genesis 14, we have one who is both a priest and a king. His name is Melchizedek. He's talked about in the New Testament as well. Let's read Genesis 14, starting at verse 17. After his return from the defeat of Cherodlnamer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Aner, Eshul, and Mamre take their share. And that's our reading for today. The passage here is primarily about Abraham, but we're going to zero in on Melchizedek. This Melchizedek, he's a mysterious character. There's a lot that we don't really know about him. Minus one verse in Psalm 110, these verses here, 18 through 20, is the only mention that he has in the whole Old Testament. So there's a lot we don't know about this Melchizedek. He quickly appears and then disappears again. He's kind of just a supporting character in even this passage. This passage is primarily about Abraham still. He has a prominent voice here. You notice that uh, the text kind of goes poetic when he talks. So he has some important things to say, but we don't really know much about who he is or where he comes from. It says... For example, that he is priest of God Most High, but how did he become a priest? How does, he, how does he know the true God, particularly back then, when he was surrounded by all kinds of pagan worship? Knowing the true God at the time of Abraham was quite remarkable. How did he, how did he know about the true God? And because he's a prominent guy, but he doesn't have a lot of surrounding information. As time went on, all kinds of legends developed about this guy. He's kind of the stuff of legend. People came up with all different sorts of traditions and ideas about where he came from or what his role is. Some people say that he was even an angel and that on judgment day he's going to have part in the judgment. And there were all of these legends that surrounded him that came up later. Like one has him born fully developed as a three-year-old with the mark of the priesthood and he must be hidden lest the wicked kill him and an angel takes him to the Garden of Eden for seven years to hide him. All this kind of stuff. So he's a prominent, important guy and because he's a prominent guy with not a lot of background, he is kind of a legendary sort of a guy. But if you look at what we know of him here, In verse 18, it says that he fed Abram's army. He fed them. Abram had just gone to war with just the people that he had with him to rescue Lot, who had been kidnapped by quite a large army, and it was a remarkable victory. I'll have to preach on that again sometime, or another time, rather. But Abraham went and defeated a big powerful army. He he should have lost. He should have been defeated, but he 
defeated this army and brought back Lot. And this was a remarkable victory for him and part of, uh, part of his welcoming party arriving back. Uh, the king, kings come out to meet him. And one of them was the king of Sodom and then there was this Melchizedek. Melchizedek shows a gesture of gratitude and respect. Like Abraham is one of us. He kind of treats Abraham like a king. You notice that they meet in the valley of the kings there. It's kind of painting Abraham as kind of a king as well, a little bit. And he's kind of contrasted with the king of Sodom, who doesn't bring Abraham anything and just barks a bunch of orders. You take this, I'll take that. And it says that Melchizedek was both a priest and a king. Both a priest and a king. Now, those roles are usually distinct. So I have this little diagram up here. Priests, they mostly deal with our acts of worship to God. So from what goes from us to God, that's what priests deal with. Kings deal with stuff that relates from person to person. So when it comes to administration, ruling and overseeing and protecting, when it comes from person to person, that's what kings deal with. And usually those are distinct roles in the Bible. There's very few priests that are kings and kings that are priests in the Old Testament especially. And then prophets deal with what God says or speaks to us there. So because, because there's these different roles and they have different emphasis, they require different sorts of gifts and such, they usually remain distinct. But Melchizedek was both a priest and a king. And it says in verse 19 that Melchizedek blesses Abraham, meaning that Melchizedek is in a superior position to Abraham. Melchizedek is up here, Abraham down here. Now, that's pretty, that's pretty big. Abraham is like the hero of not only Christians, but even Jews and Muslims. Abraham is, you know, the, the great father in the Bible, he's known as the great hero of the faith. And Abraham is, you know, way up here. But apparently, we have somebody who's even higher than Abraham. We have somebody called Melchizedek, and he's even up here. So, somebody even greater than Abraham is this Melchizedek guy. In Hebrews 7, it says, This man... This Melchizedek, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. You have somebody who's greater than Abraham. That's, that's pretty big. There's somebody who's greater than Abraham. We know very little about him. And then in verse 20 it says, Abraham gives Melchizedek a tithe. He gives them a tenth of everything that he has. Now, that should signal something. If you're, a, if you're somebody who knows the Bible, then you know that later on, all of the priests of the Old Testament received a tithe from the people. That was for mostly their, their living expenses and for the operations of the temple. So today, when people talk about tithes, we talk about tithing to the church. That's for the, the minister's living expenses as well as the operations of the church. And so when people tithe today, this is kind of the same idea. So that Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe tells us something. It tells us that Abraham recognized Melchizedek as somebody of authority Somebody who have a priestly role, and somebody who has power to bless him authentically. Not as a pagan priest, even though he was from a pagan land. This Melchizedek was a legitimate guy. He was a priest of the actual true God Most High. He gave him a tenth of everything, all of the plunder that he had received. 
So this Melchizedek is legit. He's a true priest of the true God. Now, this Melchizedek might, might be just a blip on the radar, particularly to Christians and people who adhere to the New Testament, except that there's a big chunk of Hebrews that talks about Melchizedek. This, this entire chapter in Hebrews is dedicated to how Melchizedek ta- is a foreshadowing of Christ. So the epistle to the Hebrews sees Melchizedek as a mock-up, if you will, of Christ and who he is. Melchizedek is a mock-up of Christ. A mock-up is a model or replica that's used for instructional or experimental purposes. So Melchizedek is kind of like an example of who is coming. Like Jesus, Melchizedek is both a priest and a king. Again, not many people can say that. Not many people are both priests and kings, but Melchizedek is. He's both. And so that's remarkable. So if Jesus is both a priest or prophet and priest and king, rather, um, then this Melchizedek is uniquely foreshadowing who Jesus is. Like Jesus, Melchizedek is greater than Abraham and blesses him. Okay? Abraham was kind of the great hero of the faith. So he's kind of considered the highest of the highest people that have ever lived. But we have somebody who blessed Abraham, therefore there's somebody greater than Abraham. And if there's somebody greater than Abraham, then Jesus can be greater than Abraham too. And not only is he Jesus greater than Abraham and as well as Melchizedek, but he blesses Abraham. Jesus blesses Abraham as well. Because Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the promises that God made to Abraham. If you know the story, you know that Abraham was told, look up into the sky and see if you can count all those stars. So Abraham looked, and there were so many stars up there, and God said, that's, that's going to be as many as your offspring. And then in the New Testament, it says, in Jesus, everybody who believes in Jesus is one of those stars that Abraham saw. We are children of that promise. So Jesus blesses Abraham. And like Jesus, Melchizedek receives an offering. We bring offerings to Jesus here every Sunday for his work, for his word, and for all that needs to be done in his name. We, we bring Jesus' offerings even to this day. So Melchizedek receives an offering as does Jesus, even to this day. And like Jesus, Melchizedek is king of righteousness in his name. Melchizedek, his name in Hebrew, literally means king of righteousness. And Hebrews brings that out quite a bit. That's in your Bible reading tracks. I'll just let you read that. But Jesus, his name, has a component of righteousness also. In Jeremiah 23, it says this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. You know, Jesus, the righteous branch of David. And he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. So Jesus like Melchizedek, is righteous in his name. And like Jesus, he is the king of peace in his reign. King of peace in his reign. It says that Melchizedek is the king of Salem. Salem means peace. So he is the king of peace. And uh, there's that passage from Isaiah that 
we talk about every Advent. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. When we were enemies with God in heaven because of our sin, Jesus made peace between us. And so Jesus is the King of Peace. But at the end of the day, Melchizedek is another godly human being who points ahead to Christ. He's not, he's not an angel and incarnate and a human being or anything. He's a human being, just like you and I, who points ahead to Christ. And like Melchizedek, even you and I, we, we are both priests and kings in Christ. We've talked about this before. Let's say this again. Let's answer this together. Why are you called a Christian? Because by faith I am a member of Christ, and so I share in his anointing. I am anointed to confess his name, to present myself to him as a living sacrifice of thanks, to strive with a good conscience against sin and the devil in this life, and afterward to reign with Christ over all creation for all eternity. We are prophets and priests and kings because we share in Christ's anointing. So, as priests, we have a role. Priests deal with what goes from us to God. We have a role there. As priests, we use our access to God to bless Because in Christ we have access to God, even as Jesus himself does. Because we are righteous in him, we can come before God as purely righteous, and we can ask God the Father for anything that we want. The people who don't put their trust in Christ, they don't have an audience with God. If they they pray, God hears what they're saying, but they don't stand before God as purely righteous in Christ like we do. Without Jesus, they are against God in their sin, just as we once were. So there are some verses that say these sorts of things. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened to me. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. Or in John... We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does His will, God listens to him. So, if you are somebody who believes in Christ, that means you have access. Imagine if you knew somebody who knew the president. And you, by this person, could have even an audience with the president. Would you like to meet the president? That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? You have access that other people don't. In Jesus Christ, we have access to God, the ruler of the universe, that other people don't. Our prayers for others are a priestly act. When we offer up prayers and petitions and intercessions, on behalf of others, to God, that is a priestly act. So use your priestly role to be a blessing, to intercede for others, to go to the ruler of the universe who can make anything happen and plead with him on behalf of others. That's a powerful role that believers have. It says... Hebrews 7, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest. Jesus makes intercession for us even. So as priests, that's our role for others. As kings, we use our power to serve. Melchizedek used his power and means to serve Abraham. 
and the 318 of his troops returning from battle. And Christ uses his role as king to serve. He serves us every day. So, for example, we have means, we have powers, we have abilities that we can use to help others. So sharing our resources, our knowledge, or our time to help another is being a king. That's what it means to be a king of Christ. Being a king of Christ is very different from being like the other kings that this world would have. In the world, people think that being a king means bossing other people around, lording it over people, sitting in the chair that's on the highest platform, wearing a crown, you know, having a country that's yours, you know, things like that. But Jesus, he gave us a very different example of what it means to be a king. He was ruler of the world, but he didn't act like it. He didn't claim any land for himself. He didn't put a crown on his own head. He didn't walk around wearing a crown, and he didn't walk around lording it over people. He came as a servant, and he served. And that's what it means to be a king, when you serve other people. Jesus showed us what it means to be a real king. So even if you don't wear a crown, even if you don't own a country, you can be a king when you serve like Jesus did. As Christians, we are mock-ups of our Savior. Just like Melchizedek is a mock-up of Christ who is to come, we are mock-ups of our Savior. We are models of Him. We are replicas. And we are used for instructional purposes. We are meant to be lights in this world for other people to see who Jesus is. As we go about our day, as we intercede, as we use our power and means to serve, we are meant to show Christ to other people. The book of Hebrews presents Melchizedek, just himself, as proof that Jesus' priesthood is superior to that of Aaron. He writes a whole chapter about it. It's in your Bible reading tracks this week. I hope you read it. Melchizedek himself was the proof of this. Just he himself. And so, also, you and I, ourselves, are supposed to be proof that Jesus exists and that he's still alive today. And that he always lives to intercede. There's um, there's a very prominent atheist out there. His name is Christopher Hitchens. He's a very aggressive atheist, and he goes around the world debating people for the atheist position, that there is no God, and that even religion is dangerous. He goes around just saying that. But there is one thing that he said once that always stays with me. He was talking about Mother Teresa, and he said this about her. She is the great white whale for the atheist in me. The great white whale, that's a reference to Moby Dick. It's the whale in Moby Dick that was the one that this whaler wanted to get. In other words, what Christopher Hitchens is saying here about Mother Teresa is that she, just her, and her life makes no sense to my atheist worldview. Being an atheist makes no sense because Mother Teresa existed. Just the fact that she was there and the thing, who she was and what she did just throws atheism out the window. And I think about that a lot. Because it's not our words even, as much as what we do and who we are that proves that there is a God and that Jesus is still alive. Imagine if the whole world 
or if every believer, rather, imagine if the whole world was full of believers who are Mother Teresa's. How would any atheist have any argument at that point? When we act like Christ, we ourselves are living proof that there is a God and that Jesus is His Son and He is still alive today. For today, in a day when people put trust in earthly things, believers themselves are to be living proof that Jesus is greater. He's superior to anything else that anyone might put their trust in. People live for all kinds of things. Let's live for Jesus Christ and let's be living proof that He is real and that He is good and that He is alive. Matthew 5.16 In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And we'll end on that. Let's bow our heads. Lord, our, our God in heaven, you have anointed us along with your Son Jesus to be prophets and priests and kings. So Lord, help us to use this role, this authority that you've given to us, not to lord it over others or to give glory to ourselves, but Lord, so that people would see that Jesus is real and that he's alive and that, Lord, he is superior to anything else that anyone might put their trust in. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.